Welcome to the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast, episode 66. My name is Alina Warwick, and today we have Dr. Jemmy Bertrand on the show. But before we continue with this episode, I wanted to give a quick shout out to one of our amazing listeners, Aldis Minaya. She left a review saying, so far, I'm really enjoying the podcast and have shared it with some of my friends. It's inspiring to hear these stories. Hey, Aldis. This. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I'm so happy to hear that you're enjoying these episodes. Now, if you're listening to these podcasts and they're helping you out and inspiring in any way, let me know. Leave a review on social media or wherever you're listening to these podcasts. And soon, soon after that, I it was a point where I couldn't work because I didn't have the green car yet. But then my husband had a friend that owned a mental health and behavioral health doctor facility, and they were going through bankruptcy. My husband said, well, my wife might be able to help you. And I worked for eight months without getting paid. Dr. Jemmy Bertrand came to the United States from Barcelona for love. She married her then-husband when she came to the U.S. And for a period of time, she worked for free, just as many immigrants do when they initially come and they're unable to work for pay. Flash forward a couple of years later, Jemmy was raising her two kids as a single mother. She was running her dad's business that was overseas. She was working full time and at one day, her brain stopped working, literally. She came to a complete breakdown and her body forgot how to function. Jemmy's stress piled up and her mental and physical breakdown launched her on a mission to figure out what a lifestyle was going to heal her. Through her discoveries, she launched her company, Nourish the Brain Institute, that transforms lives through healthy habits, through holistic approaches to mind-brain nutrition and therapies, one-on-one -on -one coaching, and building awareness in the mind's power. But this is not her very first company that she's launched. Although Jemmy has an MBA and a PhD, she says that her education is not being used in her company. She encourages everyone to start their businesses because anyone can do it without education and without any business background. So let's dive right in and hear all about her journey. All right, Jemmy, thank you so much for coming on the Immigrant Entrepreneurs Podcast. I truly appreciate your time and I'm super excited to hear all about your journey because you had a very interesting and personal journey to opening up your business. So welcome to the show. Thank you, Alina. It is really my pleasure. Let's get into it. Let's talk about your immigrant journey. Tell us where you're from and when did you come to the United States? I am originally from Barcelona, Spain, Catalonia. We call it Catalonia because it's in the northwest coast of Spain. And I moved here to the United States in 2013. And that's what happened. Okay. And how old were you when you came to the United States? So that was seven years ago, almost eight years ago. So I was 41 at that point. 41 years old. Awesome. And so what was it like growing up in Barcelona? It was awesome. I mean, my childhood was really is. I mean, not easy because we had, you know, like I was born during a dictatorship in Spain. So in Spain at that time, it was a little bit difficult because, as I said, my dad was against the regime and he was involved in politics. In Spain, when I was around, I don't know, I mean, that was in, I was born in 71 and the transition happened between 75 and 85. And during that period of time, we had a coup d'etat. And I remember my family packing the car and getting ready to drive to France if things were getting ugly. And fortunately, it didn't happen, but that was a possibility. Okay, and what were the things that were happening politically in Barcelona with the dictatorship? Well, Barcelona especially is an area that we always, most recently, a little bit stronger, but we have been always fighting for our independency from Spain. 
our area, the area that they belong is we are three, we were at that point, three million and a half of citizens. And we okay. were in 33% of the taxes for the whole country because it's a richest area. They will take everything they wanted from us. And, and that was, you know, like a fight that, you know, like the rest of Spain had mm-hmm. to work a little bit less because we were really hard workers. Got it. Got it. Okay. So what kinds of jobs did your dad have? My dad had a company. He was an entrepreneur himself. He had a construction company. Okay. It was small in the beginning and it grew with the time and it took him years and work, but he built up a pretty good company. And so growing up in Barcelona, did you always know you were going to live in United States? No, 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 no. That wasn't in the plans for many, many years. Okay. And so what was that journey like coming to United States? Well, I moved here to United States because I met my then husband okay. and we were, you know, like traveling a lot back and forth for a long period of time. And at one point we decided to like get married because otherwise it was going to be really, really difficult. Okay. And so was your husband in United States? Yes, he is an American. Yeah. Okay. So eventually you came out here to to marry your husband. Yes. When I came God. here, we married. And yes, that was in 2013. And soon, soon after that, I it was a point where I couldn't work because I didn't have the green car yet. But then my husband had a friend that owned a mental health and behavioral health doctor facility. And they were going through bankruptcy. My husband said, well, my wife might be able to help you. And I worked for eight months without getting paid. And I resolved the problems they had. I resolved the debt they had. And eight months later, they were already making money. Wow. What is your magic touch to that? Well, my background is in business, right? I have an MBA okay, and, and a PhD in international conflict management. Okay. So my background was in resolving problems. Got it. Got it. Okay. So tell me, you were 41 years old. You came to the United States to a brand new country. What were some of the struggles that you had to go through? The first one, the one that I found that was the most challenging of all, it was not to have my friends with me yeah. because I, I was, you know, like I, I am very attached to my family and we spoke every day, we talked every day, and we still talk every day. So I didn't have the feeling that I was missing them as much as I miss my friends. You know, I have three really, really good friends that, you know, like they will walk on fire for me and I will talk to them. And I couldn't talk to them as often because, you know, like everybody was busy and the schedules didn't match. And we talked like once a week. That was challenging for me because I didn't have friends here. Mm -hmm. You felt kind of alone and empty because now you're detached from your soulmates, from your friends, and now you're in a completely brand new country and you don't know anyone. Exactly. That was, that was the challenging part. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So how did you get acclimated to, did you find a job when you got here? I know you had worked for free for a period of time, but what happened after that? Well, after that, I kept working in the same practice as a business director. Okay. And I worked there for three years. Mm -hmm. I I finished working with them in 2016, beginning 2017. I was working as a business director there. And it was kind of challenging to to stop working there. They wouldn't let me go. (laughs) Why? Well, because, you know, like I resolved the problem and they were very attached emotionally, you know, like if you go, everything will, will fall off, you know, and it doesn't, I mean, nobody is irreplaceable. Yeah. So Jemmy, did you know English when you came to United States? I did. Okay. You picked it up in Barcelona? Well, I, yes. One of the things that my family did really well, it was that it was uh, provide teaching languages for me and my brother. And we learn, he's not as good as, uh, you know, like learning a new language as I was, but yeah, I do speak five languages. You speak five languages. 
Yes. <laughs> wow, I love it. <laughs> In Europe, everybody speaks more than one, for sure. Yes, yeah. for sure. It's it's standard for everyone outside of this country to speak fluently at least two languages, yes. if not yes. three or more. Yes. Yeah, totally. Okay, so before you tell our listeners about Nourish the Brain Institute, your company, tell me a little bit about the path you took. And I want to know if you wanted to try to go into any other fields before starting your business. Here, my life story is involved here. So what happened is in 2006, and the business came along a little bit later working in the behavioral health practice here in the United States. But I was inspired because I felt that was my purpose since 2006. In 2006, I was a single mother of two, working full time, studying, and my dad got sick with cancer. And then I thought I could run his business too. So I was working overseas, deployed three months at the time, raising my children. I have a son that was born from my body and my daughter was born from my soul. She was adopted in Haiti, uh, being oh. a woman. Yes, that's a whole that's other story because that, yeah. was, that was another adventure. <laughs> but yes, I mean, like for many, many years, I was living under a lot of stress and pressure. So I was, let me back up a little bit, right? Like I was 2006, raising my children. My dad got sick with cancer. I was still working, finishing my PhD. And I thought I can run my dad's business. My brother got really, really depressed because he was working with him. So he was a little bit, you know, like struggling on his own. And I thought I can do everything. I can do everything. And one morning I woke up and my brain decided that that wasn't going to work for it. And I couldn't move. I woke up, I, you know, like I thought, I had thoughts, so I knew I wasn't dead, mm -hmm. but my body wasn't working. Like I couldn't move my feet, I couldn't move my arms, and I had to, you know, like compartmentalize my thinking. I thought, mm -hmm. okay, you have to move your foot, move your foot, put it on the ground, and then move the other one. So it's, it's just for a split second, my brain didn't send the right signals throughout the rest of the rest of the body through the central nervous system so my body forgot how to function i was rushed to the er and they tested me for everything they thought i had ms or leukemia or some kind of neurological degeneration fortunately nothing came up positive so that meant that there is no diagnosis no medication and that was a saving grace for me because that allowed me to go home and study and do research about what was happening in my brain, right? Mm -hmm. Like the doctor said, there is nothing wrong that we can prove, but something really bad happened. So we, we have to be, you know, like very vigilant and see if there is anything that, you know, like comes up out of this. So when I went home, I just did that. I studied and, and I prepared myself and I tried all kinds of things. I was very familiar with Ayurvedic medicine because I traveled for work to India many, many times. So I was familiar with traditional Indian medicine, mm -hmm. which is Ayurveda. So I tried that one first. It was working better, but not perfectly. And then I tried Chinese medicine. I tried macrobiotics vegan. I tried all kinds of lifestyles that I thought they were healthy, but nothing was working for me completely. So then I thought, you know what, I'm just going to try one thing at a time, one foot at a time. And I journal everything. So I have hundreds of journals of, you know, like I am eating these and it feels like my energy levels are a little bit higher. Emotionally, I don't feel really great. I think it's because I'm eating animal death and things like this, you know, like it was a little bit silly, but it helped me to understand how my body worked. And Jemmy, during this time, I think, is that when you had to wear sunglasses inside your house because you were sensitive to light? Yes. So that was a side effect. So when my brain broke, I always say that my brain broke because it did forgot how to function. Lots of side effects of the problem happened. You know, like it wasn't anything terrible, but I lost my period for over a year and a half. 
like almost overnight, I dropped a lot of weight. So I, I was 90 pounds and I am five foot four. So it's not like, you know, it was wow. a big amount of weight. Yeah. And I grew hair in my face, you know, like that fur, that lanugo in the face. Mm -hmm. And then one of the worst things it was that I developed a really high photosensitivity, which is sensitivity to light, especially mm -hmm. the sun. So I had to, for a year and a half, basically live and experience the streets at night because during the day it was impossible for me to be outdoors, even with sunglasses. What would happen when you were outside? Did you have like just deep sensations in your body, itching, burning, or what would happen? Well, I couldn't open my eyes. So driving was out of the, out of the wow. picture. Wow. Yes. So my eyes had to be closed because the sun was really hurting. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's all because the neuropathy, you know, like neuropathy is the nerve, the central nervous system yeah. sends pain throughout the nerves. And then the pain reflects in another area, which is not where the problem happened, right? Which is, was the brain. So it, it happened throughout my body and the eyes were involved too. So I had this problem for that one last for a while. Still today, if I have a week that I am a little bit more stressed, there will be a point where sun is going to be tough for me. Got it. Okay. So you developed all these side effects for about a year and a half mm -hmm. and you started journaling every single thing that you ate, what it made you feel and what was going on in your body. You basically became your own doctor. Exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and what happened then? Well, and then, you know, like fast forward, I start feeling better and I learn the things that were working, like things that were working and, and things that didn't work for me, even when they were really healthy, like broccoli. Broccoli is something that doesn't agree with my stomach, like eggplant. All the night shades were out of the picture. You know, like a lot of things that were hard for my body to digest, and still were very healthy for other people, right? Like lots of vegetables that are healthy for people were not good for me. And then mm -hmm. I thought, well, that probably happens to everybody, right? Like is everybody is designed differently and it needs to be treated differently. That's why diets never work because everybody is different and people have cravings and there is emotions involved. We tied up emotions with food and with eating habits and we use food as coping mechanism. So when, you know, like when people restrict certain type of foods, they can do it for a short period of time, but there will be a point they will go back there because, you know, like the brain has these neuropathways that tell you, you have to go back there because I feel much better. It's not one size fits all. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So, and at what point did you quit your company that you were working for, or were you doing all of this, developing your immune system during the time that you were still working at your job? So one day what happened is because I was under a lot of stress due to the situation that I wanted to leave, I told them to leave, I need to leave. And they would, you know, like not accepting the fact that I wanted to leave, you know, like I know that you can go and that's it. But I wasn't raised that way. So I wanted to leave the company in a situation that everybody was okay with the next step, right? Mm -hmm. And I hired the people that needed to be there and everything was going to be fine. But still, they created a lot of resistance and the, the situation was very stressful for me. So one day I was going to work at eight in the morning and my left arm wouldn't lift up. Like I, I lost control of my left arm. And that day was the day that I thought, that's it. I put the key in an envelope. I wrote a note and I dropped it to the mailbox and I said, I'm, I'm not coming back. <laughs> you will never see me again. <laughs> because I thought they, I'm, I'm back to the same place I was. Yeah. You know, wow. and nothing happened, fortunately, but that was the signal. That was the my body saying, lady, you are going back to do the, the stupid thing that you did before. So yeah. that was that was it. 
Wow. What a very a special journey that you were on. So now that you sent the key off to your company, you went back home. What did you start doing? What did you, what was your journey to opening up Nourish the Brain Institute? Yes. So while I was working there, because my life, uh, one of the things that I've been doing since the very beginning, as, as long as I remember, is a study. I always study. I am studying still mm -hmm. today. Right, like I'm actually I'm studying a really good book about physics uh, theories, and and I was studying, and one of the things that I study is because I was very disappointed how mental health and behavioral health is being treated in the United States. Everything that they do is address the symptoms. Oh, you have depression here, appeal for depression. Oh, it turns out that you have ADHD here, a stimulant, and now something to wind you down at night. And then, oh, now you have anxiety, let's do anxiety, right? Like, instead of addressing the whole thing, you know, like, there is a lot of things that are involved in a human body, but the one thing that is most important is the things that we put in our mouth, right? And the things that we don't put in our mouth, if they are good for us, and our habits. So all those things were disregarded disregarded while they were addressing the symptoms with medication and that was very disappointing so my my stress at the end it was because i was working in a place where it was completely out of my integrity you know i, I didn't feel good doing that you know like i, I didn't feel good that that way and mm -hmm. and while i was there i studied to become a health coach but health coaching is very broad you know like it's not specialized at all it's just it's a good thing to know, but it's not, it wasn't a specialized. So I studied, I became a certified health coach. And when I move out from working there, I thought, I think we can do better than that. And I started working on my own and I created, first it was Nourish the Brain. And basically what I did, it was coaching individuals how to address their eating habits and emotions around food. And later on, evolved towards developing a program to train coaches to do what I do, be specialized in the brain and the behavior through nutrition and the science of the mind. Wow, that's amazing. And how did you develop that system or that business model to coach other coaches to go out there, spread the word and heal other people as well? Well, I think, well, the most important thing is I was talking to my mentor one day, which was, which is Bob Proctor. And he said, with all the things that you know, and all your experience in life, what are you going to do with all this knowledge the day that you die? And I thought, okay, well, I don't know. I guess it will go with me, <laughs> right? And he says, well, you have to train people to do what you do, because the world needs a lot of people doing this. And, and taking, yes. knowing how to take care of themselves and take care of others, because, you know, like it's, it's, it's just a really good place, a really good thing to have a purpose. And, and there is so many people with eating disorders, with eating habits that are not healthy, addiction, all kinds of behavioral health issues, that it is very important to have a lot of people to address all of that. In fact, as of right now, we are in the new pandemic, which is mental health. So yes. we need a lot of people doing this. Absolutely. I totally agree. So what were some of the foods that you found through your research that is absolutely a must for brain development, brain function? I will give you a couple things that must and a couple things that we shouldn't ever, okay? Okay. Uh, so okay. the one thing, <laughs> yes, the one thing that the brain needs the most is good fats, and the reason is because the brain is a big ball of fat and, and needs good fats to replenish and to have a good neuroplasticity. Good fats are basically all the fats that belong to that are plant based, like avocado, mm -hmm. avocado oil, coconut, coconut oil, olive oil. Is awesome. Also, it is loaded with vitamin D. We have all the nuts and seeds. Walnuts. All yes, walnuts are are really good, right? So yes, all the good fats come from are, are plant based. Okay. The other thing that is very important 
And of course, we need vitamins, we need protein, we need some minerals. But there is one thing that people doesn't think that much, and is oxygen. The brain needs to be mm-hmm. oxygenated. The reason is because first, it helps neuroplasticity, but second of all, is enhances performance. It means that a well oxygenated brain can rejuvenate and regenerate the cells that are missing from the day before more efficiently and much better. Also, when a body is oxygenated, we are more protected from oxidation, which is what causes cancer and all kinds of other ugly illnesses. And we get oxygen from greens, basically leafy greens, and especially a couple well, especially one superfood, which is the one that I love the most, and is chlorella. This is a microalgae that is the planet on Earth that carries the highest amount of oxygen. Also, it has a gift called the growth factor, and the plant quadruples itself every 20 hours. So it means that when it gets inside our body, it helps our cell renewal, plus increases the stem cells. So it's all good around. Wow, that's amazing. Yes. So the other thing that we never should do is to eat sugar, right? Sugar sugar is the worst invention that men could have possibly done. Sugar is highly addictive, is absorbed by the body instantly, almost as soon as it gets in our mouth. So it immediately goes to the bloodstream. It triggers the pancreas. So people, you know, like your pancreas releases insulin and fat and also decreases the amount of neurotransmitters in our brain. It means that our brain loses the capacity to take action for every thought we have. So we, every time that we think something that points towards taking an action, we need millions of neurotransmitters. As soon as sugar gets inside our bloodstream, decreases the neurotransmitters. So for us, it's really difficult to stop doing what we are doing which is eating sugar at the time, right? Like I'm sure that all the listeners can relate to that one, right? Like we grab something sweet, like a piece of chocolate or a piece of candy. And we say, I'm going to just eat this little piece. And (laughs) you put it in your mouth and you cannot stop. And the reason is because you lost the will to do it because there's not (laughs) enough neurotransmitters in the brain. Yes. Okay, so I'm super, super excited to talk to you about this because about nine years ago, I did go plant-based. Well, 90% Mm plant-based. I still eat some fish, Mm -hmm. some black caviar every once in a while. But I wanted to ask you, what tips can you provide to our listeners as far as how can they remove you know, the sugar out of their diet? How can they implement new and healthy things? And I'll tell you one thing that I did, what I did not grow up plant-based. I did not grow up in a very healthy family oriented. We were Russian. So we had lots of meat and potatoes and junk food and processed food growing up. And we grew up, you know, going to the food bank, which is absolutely like, you know, not healthy food. So when I made that switch, there was definitely a mind connection, like you mentioned, like definitely something emotional had to break where I considered junk food and anything meat, dairy, and eggs related completely dead food to me. So when I made that switch in my brain, that helped me out to remove those items out of my diet. But what are some things that anyone else can implement to increase those plant foods that you're talking about and to remove the bad foods, remove that sugar out of our diets? Because the brain is basically fat, as I said before. The one thing that satisfies the brain the most is fat. To avoid or to skip cravings, you have to eat fat. I always tell my clients and my students, you have to pick your battles. You have to prioritize one thing first. So when we are trying to quit sugar, most likely you will be ingesting more calories because you will be eating more fat. But that's okay because that fat is being used by your body as energy. Plant-based fat is extremely healthy and it's being used as energy. 
So it's not like those calories are going to stick in your body like you are eating sugar or animal fat. It's very different. The other thing is you can, if you still have cravings, adding into your diet sweet vegetables. That calms the sweet cravings down. Sweet vegetables like carrots, all the pumpkins and squashes, uh, asparagus, all those things are sweet and calm the cravings down. Sweet potato is very good for that. But basically, to me, the one that helps the most is fat. You know, like if you have to snack in something, it's snack in walnuts. It's really good fat and it's satisfying. It has a lot of fiber, so your stomach will feel full faster. Because here is the thing. Between your brain and your gut, there is 20 minutes of disconnection. It means that imagine how much food you can eat in 20 minutes, especially if you are fast, before your brain realizes that you are eating, right? Like wow. If you eat something sweet, which basically dissolves immediately in your mouth and in your gut, that doesn't fill your stomach. So that means that your brain will take a long time before it realizes that you are eating. When you are eating something that is a lot of fiber, like walnuts or vegetables, you have to chew much more. The chewing process alerts the brain saying, eh, we are eating now, right? So you will feel satisfied much faster. Got it. Got it. Such powerful tips. Thank you so much for sharing that, Mm -hmm. Jemmy. So tell me a little bit more about your company. I see that you guys are having programs, you guys have events, you guys have that academy that you created. You also have a book. What are these, some of these things that you have implemented? So tell me a little bit more about your company. So here is the thing is one of the premises that I always follow and is the one that works the most is the most important thing to me is the giving instead of the receiving. So one of the things that I like to do is be involved in anything that can help underserved people. And to me, in my case, are going to be always the veterans. And the reason is because they help me, the military in the United States, actually the Air Force, saved me, helped me to get my daughter. Without them, today, I don't know if I will have my daughter from Haiti. So I decided as soon as I got here, I I thought I have to find a way to pay back to these people. And it turns out that it is a very underserved community. So I collaborate with the Veterans Outreach Program here in town. We have a weekly group with them. I also am a member of the Council for Suicide Prevention in the county. And most recently, uh, well, six months ago, I started coaching special operations for the Honor Foundation. So all of this is volunteer work, but all of this opens you doors to other things. You know, I get to know a lot of people and I love doing that for them. So this is one of the things that I mentioned first, because... As I say, you know, like it opens a lot of, the giving helps a lot with the receiving. So I always like to mention them just in case somebody feels inspired and wants to help them too, because they need uh, as much as help as possible. Then like I did coach one-on-one for a very long time. I'm still coaching one-on-one very selectively. I have coaches that work for me, uh, graduates from our program. They are working with one-on-one clients. They are coaching groups. My job is basically the training. We have students. I am a government provider. I am a federal provider. So we have contracts with the government to sell the programs for veterans and the Department of Defense. So we have like the whole program around the whole company, I think, is very recently is flourishing and going really well. Got it. Wow. You're plugged in into so many different groups and so many different aspects, which is amazing. And I noticed you guys have an unlimited group membership, a monthly membership. What do you guys talk about? What do you guys get into in these monthly membership topics? I love that you asked this question. So the the membership, (laughs) the membership is an idea that my program manager had, Emily. She thought 
you know, like the education that we provide for students is very complete and is, you know, like is work that you have to want to do. But then we have the groups and the groups are something that a lot of people should be part of. So what happens with the membership is we have three groups a week that are included in the membership. On Monday, we study the the science of the mind. On Tuesday, Elaine Hill, which is one of the coaches, teaches about brain health. And on Thursdays, Ashley teaches about gut health. And then one Saturday a month, I teach a lecture about the science of the mind. So all of that is included in the membership. And you can be in one of the groups or you can be in all of them for less than $50 a month. And it's awesome education. I love how you bring that membership piece into your business model as well, because during COVID, everything was broken up as far as creating these relationships and mentorships and connections. And if you're having an online membership that brings these people back together to collaborate, to meet together and to develop some, you know, some new healthy habits to keep our mental health strong and sharp. So I absolutely love, love that um, concept that you have. So Jemmy, I do want to get back to your immigrant entrepreneur journey. So I wanted to ask, how old were you when you started your business? This one, because I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. So the, the latest one, which is here in the United States, and I was talking to somebody last week and he was saying, what you did is pretty, is pretty impressive. And, you know, like you, you did that in a very short period of time. It doesn't seem like that to me because, you know, like I would like everything done by yesterday. Yeah. (laughs) But yes, I mean, like this business was created when I was like the corporation, legally the corporation started in 2019. Oh, okay. So a couple of years ago, two years ago. But the business per se started really in 2015 here. Okay. So you were in your 40s. Yes. Yes. I was okay. my 40, 43. I was 43 years old when I created this company. Yes. I love it. Okay. And when you said you were an entrepreneur all your life, what did you do in Barcelona? Well, many things. But my first <laughs> my first business, I bought it when I was 23. And it was a hair salon. Wow. But that was while I was studying. Then in 2016, I created a business with a friend. We invented two baby products. It was a baby bassinet made in recycled cardboard and printed. It was beautiful. And then baby bathtub, which was foldable. So you can pack it up in a very small space and travel with it. And then this, you know, like, and also at meanwhile, I was working overseas as an independent auditor for nonprofits, which is my work with, for the PhD. I've been an entrepreneur. The only time, I mean, I would say the longest time that I worked for somebody was when I moved here and I worked for the behavioral health practice. Otherwise, I worked always for myself. I never worked for anybody else. Yeah. So there's definitely an entrepreneurial drive from the very, very early stages for you. Got it. Okay. And did you close that company for the baby products or is it still running? We did. We did because what happened is two things. The first one is we got into that really bad crisis in Europe. And the products were not cheap. So people, you know, like found that it was expensive. And the other thing is I moved here to the United States in at the end. And, and that was really rough on like difficult in, in getting to do things from one side to the other. Because I was with a partner, with a friend of mine, and it was challenging to keep up with it. So we decided to close that. I still have the trademarks and the patterns. So, you know, you never know. Yeah. Yeah. So what made you keep going on your entrepreneurial path? Because if you closed it, there was some issues with it. And I'm sure you, you can see that, you know, some of the failures that the business might have taken, but what totally. made you keep going and still pursuing a brand new venture? Because this is what I know how to do oh. is creating something out of nothing is what I know how to do is, is what I know I am good at. I am not good 
had taken orders from somebody else. <laughs> but yes, you know, like the, the fear of failing again, that was a thing in the beginning. But it's not in my personality to think about what didn't work in the past. I always think, how can I do it different that so I don't get in the same place, right? Yeah. So I always, I always think. So I have always a schedule time during the week, every week, just to think. So I can create new things, so I can think new strategies, so I can think about the next move. So I think it is very important for everybody to have time to think. Got it. Yeah. Some powerful tips. Thank you so much. So mm -hmm. Jemmy, how long did it take your business that nourished the brain Institute to start seeing some real attraction in the beginning stages? Was it when you first launched your website, you started seeing clients come through or how long did that take for you? To me, I, I don't feel like it's being so much through media or social media at all. To me, it's being more at the worth to mouth, you know, like one person telling somebody else. Referrals. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning it was, you know, like one client here, one client there, but I went really quick to try to be involved with everything, you know, like I, I always like to be involved in the community. So one of the things that I did first, it was reach out to Cuesta College and see if one of my programs could be taught there. And the group, actually the membership, the groups that are being taught in the membership, one of them was taught at Cuesta. What college? The community college here in San Luis Obispo. Okay, got it. Yeah. So, you know, like I always try to be involved with the community and that, you know, like always there is people that know somebody and bring something else or somebody else. You know, for me, that was important. I said right now, you know, like it's different because now I have a budget for marketing. Yeah. <laughs> so that helps right but yeah i mean and working working all the time all the time and and having my mind always in the goal you know like mm -hmm. being in target all the time so yeah and, and and you know like having very clear that nothing comes for free or easy yeah. because people might tend to think that oh she she has it really easy because everything is rolling. Now it's rolling, but you know, like you have to make it roll for a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> Keep it rolling, Jemmy. <laughs> yes. Yes. I love it. Okay. So do you think it was like a couple of months when you started seeing these clients or like immediately you started seeing one client and then it started to build up in a couple of weeks or a couple of months where you are fully launched and you have all of these different business models implemented? I want to say that from the get-go, I was lucky. I mean, to me, what was the key for the business to thrive in the very beginning, it was because it was based in my purpose. Got it. So this is my life. So I'm preaching what I'm doing every single day. So it's, I am so aligned with what I do that it's impossible not to work. You know, I like guess yeah. it's, it's what I have in my thoughts, my actions and my words are aligned in the same direction all the time. So, it's, you know, like it's not to me, it's, it's, it's that's what makes it work. It comes natural for you. Yes. And yeah. I am so sure you get stopped at the streets walking around because your face is just completely glowing and you look so young and vibrant. And I'm so sure people are always asking, what is your secret or what do you do? How do you stay so healthy and fit? Because I got to say, what you mentioned, the sugar thing, you're totally right. It is addicting and we have to get that information out there because, it, you know, America thrives on sugar. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. I absolutely love it. So I know you mentioned yeah. that you worked with a mentor. Did you mm -hmm. have a mentor that helped you out to start your business, the Nourish the Brain Institute, or did the mentor come a little bit later? The mentor came later. Okay. When I could afford, when I could afford him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what did you do in the beginning? You just did this all by yourself? Yes. I mean basically yes. You know, I had somebody from EO 
that was very inspiring to me. And she always encouraged me to do my own thing. And still today, she sends people along my way all the time. And that was Hazel Ortega. So I have to give her the shout out for that one. Aww. Because she believed in me from the very beginning. That's awesome. And what Jemmy is talking about is Entrepreneurs Organization. That's the EO group that you're talking about, right? Correct. Got it. Okay. So do you think it's important for immigrant entrepreneurs to get connected, to build relationships, to start their businesses? Yes. When you start a business and you are from a foreign country, right? Mm -hmm. Like many things, you don't know how they work and many things you don't trust and many people you don't trust. But that's just based in the fear that we have. So if you can let this thing go and you can, you know, like get involved with your community in the first place, get people to know you and you know others, to me, that's a key to work and have you know, like a successful, a successful business. So, so powerful. And how do you stay productive throughout the days? Because you're doing so many different things. You're involved in the community. You have the academy. You wrote a book. You're, you're involved in so many different things and you have kids. So how do you stay productive? Do you write goals or is there something that you implemented that helped you out? The one thing that helps me the most is the structure. I am a very structured person. And I wake up really early in the morning, 5, 5.30, and I go to work out. That's my first thing. I go to the gym at that time, and I work out for 45 minutes. I go home, shower. I have a good breakfast because breakfast is my favorite time of day. Yeah. And, and after breakfast, I start working. And I work with clients, and I work with admin staff and planning and with my coaches and, you know, like, whatever the day brings and but the structure for me is very important you know like having a schedule knowing what's next what's next what's next helps me to stay sane and then if i have time off when i have time off i will you know like enjoy i will go to nature i will hang out with friends i will enjoy you know like all the aspects in my body and I take care of myself, you know, like I practice wellness every single day and I do it, you know, like in different ways. I practice some cryotherapy, red lights. I go to the spa anytime I want. But, you know, like for the most part, I work <laughs> all yeah. day. So it's definitely important to develop these structures early on in the immigrant entrepreneur journey. That way, when we do get bigger and grow our businesses, it's going to be easier to follow those structures. Is that what I'm hearing? Correct. The structure is is important for everybody. Mm -hmm. Your brain, your brain thrives much better if you can create the structure always. Your brain needs to know what is coming. So then, you know, like it performs much better. It's getting ready. The neural pathway starts flowing faster and more efficiently. And then self-care, you know, because you will be working many hours. So you have to take care of yourself. That's for sure. Yes. Investing in yourself and investing in your health is absolutely powerful. (laughs) Yes. You know, like nobody's going to take care of your body if you don't do it. Yes, absolutely. Let's switch gears. I wanted to talk about the not so positive side of an entrepreneur life and which is mistakes or failures. And I wanted to see if there's any story behind a mistake that you learned or something that you've learned to implement to make a positive change through mistakes or failures that you've had. Yes. To me, the the big failure, it was the business that I created, the baby business that I created in Barcelona. And yes. when I moved here, that was something that the fear of failing again, it was it was really, really strong in the beginning. You know, like, I don't want to fail. I don't want to fail. I don't want to fail. But when I learned how to let go to that, it was so much freedom after that, you know, because while we are so fearful of failing you are still thinking about the failure and that's what you attract more in your life the moment that you let that go everything flows you know like we are energy and and energy comes in and out throughout our body and our mind constantly and 
And that was the biggest lesson that I learned and is the one thing that I am most proud to say that I finally got it. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and I love talking about this because a lot of people can look from the outside and say, hey, that, you know, you're rolling. Like you mentioned, you did this so fast and you're so successful. But as we look at the Elon Musks of the world and the Mark Zuckerbergs, there are plenty of mistakes and failures that they've gone through. But the most important thing like you've done is to let it go. Let it go. Keep on going forward. Keep on moving moving forward to accomplish your big dreams and your big goals. And I absolutely love, and I don't know why, but I love talking about mistakes and failures because we cannot be afraid of approaching them. And then we also cannot be afraid of letting them go, letting them go and continue to push forward. There is an awesome book that I always go, is is one of my go-tos for entrepreneurs and is You a Square from Price Pritchett. Okay. Is an awesome book and he says embrace failure because that's how we learn. We learn from that. And to me that was that was the lesson, you know. Like I, I failed. I know how to not do it this way. It's about quantum leaps. Got it. It's, okay. You know, like the jump of faith, you jump, you do it, you go for it. You will figure out the way yes. when you are there. Right? But yes, you have to jump. So this one is a really good one for people that has once has an idea and wants to become an entrepreneur and they don't know, oh my gosh, when I will have the money, when I will have the time, when, you know, like I will try to do a couple clients here and there, but at the same time I am working in this place that is consuming my life and my energy. That way it's never going to happen. Yeah. Because you are basing your decision in fear. So it's, you know, like the quantum leap is jump, go for it, and you will figure out a way. Yes. I love it. I'm going to find the book and link it in the show notes for our listeners to grab a hold of. And I wanted to ask about what you meant, what you just mentioned, which is, you know, saving. A lot of people say, oh, I want to save a lot more money and then I'm going to start a business or a new venture. Did you have any savings when you started your company? Zero. I had nothing. (laughs) Oh my goodness. So how did you do it? Well, I, I was I was working, so I, I paid for the education then. But and, and then, you know, like slowly but surely, of course, my husband helped me in the beginning, you know, because I was, you know, like food was paid and whole housing was paid too. But besides that, no, I didn't have any savings, you know, nothing. Okay. And did you have to raise any capital or did you start it from your house and you had low I started from my house, from my house. Okay, so you had low cost. The the longest time I didn't have expenses. So that was, you know, like Mm -hmm. having expenses in the beginning, you you know, like that was a good thing. But soon enough, I had, you know, like invest money. I mean, as soon as I made some money, I was investing money. This is is a different mentality, right? When you talk to people that has a fixed income, right? And I'm going to say teachers because, you know, my husband is one of them. You know, like it's really hard for them to understand that the money that you make is going to be needed in the company, Mm -hmm. right? Like if you want to grow, you have to invest money. You cannot keep, you know, like saving and saving and saving because you are not going to grow. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to save, but at the same time, you have to invest. Reinvest in the business. Yes, absolutely. To make it grow, to make it better. Such powerful insights. I love it, Jemmy. And I wanted to ask you, what does the American dream mean to you? I don't know. I I feel like I am living my dream every single day. I do the thing that I love the most and I meet the people that I want to meet and I just threw to the universe whatever thought I have and the universe makes it happen. So I guess that's the American dream, if you want to call it like this. To me, it's my dream. Yeah. (laughs) I would say that that's basically it. Can anyone reach their American dream? Anybody. If I did it, anybody can do it. My education didn't help me here. My education is not being used in my company. So it's it's not like, oh, you have to have education. You have to have a business background. No, you do not. I could have done it the same way without any kind of education. So I I encourage everybody to try because it's just a good experience. It's just a good experience. 
So powerful. I love it. So what are some things you would advise the next aspiring immigrant that wants to start their own business? And you've dropped so many valuable points already, but if there's anything else that you would like to share. Well, the one thing that you want to do is keep in mind that if you have an idea, if you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hand. And that's very much one of my proctors saying, but it's true, you know, like it's, it's, you have to see it in your mind in order to make it happen. But if you already do, you just have to go for it because it means that it, it is already created somewhere in your thoughts, but it, it is already out there. So it's, you know, like it's, and never give up. That's the other thing. If you have an idea that you believe in, not giving up ever. I love it, Jemmy. Thank you so much for ending the show with, if you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hand. So powerful, such insightful, and yet so, so simple that anybody can grasp a hold of and reach their American dreams, reach their goals, their destinies, if they're aligned with their passions and their intuition. So thank you so much, Jemmy, for coming on to the Immigrant Entrepreneur's Journey. I truly appreciate your time and your journey is going to inspire so many immigrants, I know for sure. So thank you again. Well, Alina, it is absolutely my pleasure. And it was really, really nice talking to you today. All righty, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. If there are any links that were mentioned in this episode, make sure to check them out on my website under this episode to find all the links conveniently located in the show notes. I just wanted to ask for a quick favor. If you could please leave a review wherever you're at listening to this podcast. Also, if you're an immigrant entrepreneur and would love to be on my podcast, please email me and we'll get connected. I'll see you guys all next time for another exciting and impactful episode. Take care.